Blessed be the Lord. Let us bless God's holy name. Our God, His glory fills the earth.
everything is pretty, right? Everything, even the special holiday sales, make it easier for us to participate in the festive holiday season. The shiny trinkets offered this time of year give the illusion of hope. Our culture is good at marketing hope, aren't they? We're very good at, at marketing an appearance of peace, especially this time of year when trees go up and lights adorn our homes. Candles in the windows, <coughs> carols at the spinach. However, every holiday season has its detractors, right? If, there's, if it's not Ebenezer Scrooge, it's the Grinch. And today we've heard from the biblical Grinch. Today it seems to be that the Grinch has stolen our holiday cheer, our mood. John the Baptist in the midst of Advent can steal away anybody's happy festivity. And the words of John the Baptist pierce our happiness. And they remind us of the reality of our lives in the wilderness. These are tough times. Nobody has to pretend anymore. Our world is mean, and they cover it up. Those who come to see the lights this Advent in Bethlehem, those of us who are going to make the journey even a couple weeks more to Bethlehem to visit the carols and Bethlehem and the lights cannot ignore the distraction of what is taking place in our hearts. There's a hole in our hearts that no matter how we try to fill it, we can't. We can't fill it by ourselves. The cranky and disagreeable heart of John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of our hearts makes us uncomfortable as we listen to him year after year. Repent, the kingdom of God is near. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Those are uncomfortable words to me. But they tell of a heart that is in disarray. The axe is lying at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown away. What tree are they talking about? Whose tree? The hopeful reality of John the Baptist, of this voice crying out in the wilderness, prepares the way for one to come to rearrange our lives. And he prepares us for the Lord to make our hearts ready for God to decorate our lives. The only thing is this tree that seems to be cut down, the tree of Jesse. This family tree of Jesse is cut down, will not be decorated with tinsel and lights, but rather it will be trimmed with the righteousness of God's love. It will be trimmed in kindness and compassion and mercy for everyone who approaches this God. Trimming a tree can be one of the most important symbols of any Advent. It was a great uh, symbol last week for the children and families to come and put up this tree. And even in our homes, it can be one of the most important customs during Advent, right? Is not the tree one of the most important? I've heard more people this year say, I just need a minute just to throw up my tree. Just throw it. I used to remember it was a big deal to put up the tree. As a small child, I can remember. We don't do it anymore. Of course, everybody's got artificial ones. But we used to go out in the wilderness. And we used to go through the woods and the New blanket of fallen fresh snow in northern Baltimore County, almost across the line into Pennsylvania. Did y'all used to do this? Did you do it this year yet? 
Then we just go to the corner lot and pick up one that's all, been already been bound. But I remember Dad taking that butcher knife and cutting that thing down. And when he got it down, we'd bring it home and we'd spend all Saturday afternoon waiting for Mom to rearrange the furniture in the living room. Right? Karen and I would sit on that sofa and wait. And we'd twiddle our thumbs. And before Mom, we were punching each other and rolling around on the floor, waiting for Mom to get that room just perfectly arranged so that they could fit that tree in somewhere. And then there was Dad. That was only half the time we spent waiting. Then there was Dad who had to trim up the base of the tree to make sure it got into that, that, uh, that metal thing just right. And then he would beat the bottom of it with a hammer, denting the bottom of the Christmas tree stand, making sure that those, those bolts went in equally you know the three bolts that you had to tighten equally into the stump? And Karen and I would sit there and we would wait for mom and dad to make these slight adjustments. It seemed to take forever as we sat on the sofa. <coughs> what seemed to be one of the most important holiday symbols. The holiday symbol today is the stump of Jesse, the family tree, the people of God. For many families, the tree has become a point of contention. From the Griswold, my favorite, to Charlie Brown. You know, the little Charlie Brown tree. <coughs> For the Simpsons, of course. The ritual of decorating such a huge symbol has brought a little more stress to a lot of families. When we got married, I see you peeking out from behind me. <laughs> Christy and I had to work out our tree trimming customs, our traditions. Each of us had to consider what was important in our tree trimming discussion in order to make our, our family come together just right. You know, the big questions about marriage are not, you know, where you'll go to church, where you'll live, and who's going to have a job. The big questions of marriage is white lights or color lights. <laughs> Homemade ornaments, or do you go out and pre-buy the store-bought ornaments? Do we decorate with tinsel or garland? To garland or tinsel is a big question. <laughs> However, the tree that John speaks about in the wilderness is one that has not been bearing fruit of righteous decoration and will be cut down at the root and thrown into fire because it hasn't been properly adorned with justice, with God's fairness. All the people in between David's reign and now Isaiah and the people coming out of Babylonian captivity, John invites them to see the new branch coming forth out of the family tree of God's people that will be decorated in the presence of God's incarnate word. The vision of God was that people would take care of the widows, the orphans, and the stranger, and they would welcome in the outcasts and the downtrodden. How have we adorned the tree that we have been given? Have we trimmed it with God's justice? See, Advent gives us the appropriate time to make these adjustments to our spiritual tree, to rearrange our hearts a little bit so that God can come in and redecorate us, renew us, reform and reshape us. Is there room in your life for God's new branch to come? Is there room, are we willing to allow God to come into this space this whole and decorate us. What things need to be cut back and trimmed in order that we may finally see that new branch shooting forth out of the stump. Have you ever looked in the woods at the base of the tree and actually cleared away the leaves and the brush and actually saw the new green sprout coming <coughs> out? That's what is happening as John the Baptist is saying, a stump from the root of Jesse's family is coming out. 
How will God trim the tree of our present culture? Whether we like it or not, God is coming to redecorate our lives. He's coming to move into your hearts. He's coming to rearrange the furniture. He's going to invite and throw a party in your life and invite people who you wouldn't even have thought about inviting to the party. <clears throat> God's life with us seems a little bit unsettling at this time. But John's voice is too unsettling. Because here, to know the love, right? To know the love by which we are called challenges us to live responsibly toward others. John invites the people of Israel to turn their hearts toward a new way of seeing God in the world. He invites his people to see a new way to interact with the world. Get ready, he says. There is one coming into the world that will challenge the very way that you have decorated your family's tree. But when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came for baptism in the Jordan, one writer says he called them the brood of vipers because he perceived that they were only being baptized to flee out of fear. <coughs> it's sad in our day and age Clem says, to see people serve God out of fear. However, John encourages us to produce fruit that is worthy of our baptism. To produce good works. To be kind to one another. And turn the other cheek. To humble yourself in the sight of God. To take the back seat when allowing others to go forward. If we develop holy habits of prayer and attending to worship and keeping our lives in order, then we will be ready. We won't have to do a crash course or stay up late night studying for what God wants from us the next day. I've been struck this past six months, maybe to a year, by the selfish meism of our culture. The selfish, me-centered culture of our contemporary world is not just outside these doors, but it's inside here as well. And when I say inside here, I'm talking about inside all of our churches. And then it's up on this side of the altar rail as well. Because I notice a lot of, I'm more around preachers than others. So you may see this as well. <clears throat> We have always been a self-centered culture. I mean, that's part of the American dream is to be individual and free and be selfish. And... But this past year, I've just noticed that people seem to be more self-indulgent, throwing temper tantrums because their team didn't win. But reading Isaiah, last week, I became interested in the prophet's words like I've never been interested before. I guess it's in context. It's always in context of what you're going through. He shall not judge with his eyes, right? Or decide by what he hears. But with righteousness, Isaiah says, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. A lot of times we judge things and we judge people by what we see and by what we hear. But Isaiah says the one is coming who will not judge by what he sees and what he hears because he is righteousness. He has already established the righteousness within him and he is identified as the rightness. God has come to be rightness for us. He doesn't come because of these things. He becomes because he wants us to be righteous. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. And I discovered something. We're selfishly distracted by ourselves because we don't even know what this tree of Jesse is all about. 
There are some here who continue to study the Word of God. But there are many throughout our churches, all of our churches, who just don't know what this family is all about. And neither do they care. Please listen, John the Baptist is saying. I beg you to listen to where this family tree is going. God will judge not by the appearance, but by who he is. The word of God is named justice and righteousness. The family tree of the Jews, of the Hebrew people, for generations had gone sour and selfish, and then they were taken into Babylon, into captivity. They were removed from the promised land because they treated each other with ignorance and distraction of their selfish ways. And Isaiah becomes the heart of John as he speaks of this hole that the one is coming to fill that space is the tree of Jesse in our lives just crammed into the corner once a year? Do we bring out our spiritual branches every once in a while to show God that we're still worthy, I'm still here? Do we bring out our spiritual branches just every once in a while attending to the habits and rituals? Our misguided materialism, our wants and our desires, empower a market-driven, selfish consumerism that creates a superficial reflection of artificial life, not the one true life. The extravagance of what appears to be celebration to joy cannot mask the righteousness of the one coming in to dwell in our lives. Let us see God's righteousness that calls us to a new life. That little sprig at the bottom of the base of that root is God's new life in Jesus to dwell with us. Jesus is going to start over from scratch. And he's bringing God's righteousness to us. It's time for us to, to lay aside all the holiday baggage of the past and to bear fruit worthy of good repentance. John invites us to hear the generation's message over and over again, echoing the words of Isaiah, crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway for our God. You know what was happening? This was the role that was originally given to the angels to come and to lead the people out of Babylon back to the Holy Land. They said, you're free, you can go back. And the angels came and they said, here it is, I'm going to level the valleys and level the mountains. I'm going to fill in the valleys, make this big, wide construction project. I'm going to build a highway for our God so you all can go back to the Promised Land. And they wandered back. But John the Baptist, like that modern bulldozer, that message that was leveling the hills and filling in the valleys, making a smooth, straight way, not for the people to return to the promised land, no. But John the Baptist was to make a way for God to have come to them. That this highway, this new highway, was for God to come to them, not them to return to no matter how you see church life, no matter how you see the religious life of your personal soul, it's not about you. God is coming to you because he loves you. And he wants you so bad, he's willing to do anything for it. He is crying out in this wilderness for us to return to him. And he's not waiting for you to return. He's going to come to us. All you got to do is stand there and wait for him. That's, that's what this Advent is saying this year. <laughs> Why in the world do we still have hurting people?
people. If you have a, a roof over your head and you have a food in your bellies, doggone it, you are blessed and you should be happy. People are out there in the western part of the state and in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, living in makeshift dwellings like the people of God that came home from Babylon. It's, it's about the righteousness of God coming and appearing to us and, and making us into people that are kind and that bear fruit worthy of our baptism. What a wonderful thing that God is going to knock down every tree to get to you and he's going to crawl through the wilderness because he loves you. That's that little spring. I, I beg you to go into the woods this week. And dig around the base of those leaves and, and look for a little spring coming out of that root, out of that base of that tree. And think about Jesus starting over with us. Starting a new covenant. And starting again. Saying, won't you be my friend? And do good things to one another. Be kind. And share what you have with each other. I think that's what John was getting at. Thank you. And please.
pray with me. O oh God who was and is and is to come, we give you thanks for this day of worship in which we come before you um, as, as people who are seeking new life, who are seeking the incarnation of you, O oh God. God, we are mindful that our world is not what it should be, and so today we pray for those things that are on our hearts and minds that are dear to us. We also pray for Standing Rock. We pray for Gatlinburg. We pray for Syria. May all these things call us to action, call us to change, call us to be better people. God, during this Advent season, we may we be mindful that there are people out there that are hurting, that are not having a merry season of brightness, but instead a deep abyss of darkness. May we shine light to them and with them and minister with them and for them. May we do all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
could be you. God is coming to you. Open your heart and let him in. Because he's coming. And he is the only thing, he is the only person who can fill your life to the fullness of glory. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.